Awesome. It's lovely to be with you this morning and thank you for the privilege um, to preach the Word of God to you. I think it is something that you not just get invited to do, but it, it, it's a calling, right? It's something that God calls you um, to do. And ever since I've uh, finished school, I actually, in school, um, for the first time, preached to a group of, of youth. And um, it was awful. It was bad. <laughs> I stumbled over my words and I didn't know what I was saying. Um, I, I got to the end of the sermon and I didn't even know what I said. Um, I, I don't think anyone knew what I, what I was saying. Um, but something happened that day that really convinced me that this is something that I want to do well. It's, it's something that I want to do for the rest of my life. Because I am now, yeah, as a servant of God, trying to communicate something that God has already communicated to us through His Word. Um, but that, something that is relevant, something that we all long to know, and also that, that we need to know. The Bible is the Word of God, um, but the Bible is also described as food for our soul. And without food, we die. And so we are all human beings who's born in sin, um, born to die. And um, also, because of sin, death reigns inside of us. And so we need the light of the Word of God to shine in the darkness of our hearts. We need the, the, the Word of God, the bread of life, to give us life. And so this is something that I think is extremely significant. Um, and I think we need to pray before we start. Ask the Lord to speak to us. Open our hearts. Father, we thank you so much for your Word that you've revealed to us. Um, you've revealed Jesus Christ to us, your Son, who is the Word. Um, incarnate and we thank you Lord that you speak to us so clearly through your word and we pray today that your word would speak to us clearly um, that your, you would open up our hearts uh, that we would be you know, sanctified washed, cleansed encouraged and built up in the faith Lord, that we might know you after we walk out of this building Lord that we might be closer to you Closer than we were when we came in here. And for those of us who don't know you, Father, we pray that you would reconcile us to yourself through your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Gospel. Speak to us, reveal to us wonderful things out of your Word, because it is wonderful, it is beautiful, and it's life-giving. We pray by your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Family, if you have a Bible with you, uh, we actually also have the scriptures on the screen, so you can just follow with me. What's nice about following the scripture on the screen is just it's the same translation that I'm going to read from. Um, so you don't have to ask questions about uh, differences in words and sentence structure and grammar. Okay, so today uh, we are continuing our study in the, the book of Romans, Romans 15, verse 14 to 22. Uh, we're going to read from verse 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, in the priestly service of the gospel, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience, by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I, I practiced this, you got it wrong. Illyricum, Illyricum, that's the word, Illyricum. I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, and thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Amen. So the sermon title for this morning's message is Christ's Mission as the Church's Ambition. <laughs> it's just so we can remember. Paul is saying a lot of stuff in the scripture, um, in, in, in this passage, 
But one of the main things that stands out is his ambition to preach the gospel where it has not yet been proclaimed. And his ambition is based off of Jesus' commission in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, where he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I commanded you to do. And I will be with you always, to the very end of the age. So, Jesus' commission, before he left earth, is to go and make disciples of all nations. So that specific word is, is a reference to all ethnic groups, to all people groups in the world, um, groups of people. And so I think it's so important to just be reminded this morning, nothing of, of what I'm going to say is going to probably be new to anyone. It's just a reminder of what the church exists for. Why are we gathered like this this morning? Well, it's for the glory of God. But not just for the glory of God inside of our own lives. It's for the glory of God across the world. For all of creation to testify of His glory. And how do you do that if you are lost? How do you do that if you don't know Christ? You can't. You need the gospel to set you free from your sin, to reconcile you to God. And so as a result of that, to live a life that glorifies God. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. And if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit, and your fruit will be to the glory of God, right? Let your light shine before others so that they might see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is a relevant message, I believe, for the church today. Not just the Baptist church, but for every church in town, across the world, especially in Western culture. The church has many ambitions, many unbiblical ambitions to be popular, to be relevant, to be hip and woke and fun and entertaining and to, to, to almost be palatable to the world, those who are lost. And so what Charles Spurgeon, he didn't believe in prophecy, but what he prophesied and what he said would come eventually, I didn't believe in modern prophecy, but what he said would come, and he, he, he made a, 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 an idea, it's like, this is coming in the future, is that he said that there will come a time where the church will no longer be filled with sheep um, fed by a shepherd, and a shepherd leading the flock. But there will come a time where the church will be filled with goats entertained by clowns. whole entertainment show. For who? Not the sheep. For the goats. Those who don't know Christ. And I think it's impossible for us to call a shot on the condition of someone else's heart. But the Bible clearly speaks and says that what the heart is full of, the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And what the, out of the heart flows sexual immorality, murder, strife, quarrels. So, so how can we see the condition of the hearts of the people in the church while well, we look at their lives. We look at their way of speaking. And we can see that the church is full of goats, lost people, claiming to be Christians, who might be deceived, who's most probably deceived. And so if we don't make Christ's commission, the church's ambition, we will fail to be the church in the first place. We will come to define church on our own terms. So the objective for today is to just encourage the church, the Baptist church, um, to focus its prayers and efforts towards supporting the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Just to give you a little bit of an introduction to uh, specifically this passage in Romans 15, verse 14 to 22. Um, Paul wrote Romans after completing his missionary work in the eastern part of the Roman Empire before he visited Jerusalem with the collection of the saints in need there. So one of the main purposes of the whole letter of Romans is to present Paul's position on some Jewish and many other salvific issues um, because he was preparing the church in Rome to partner with him in his new mission now to Spain. Right? So he's finished his work in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, now he's on his way to the western part, 
um, and he's preparing the church in Rome who's, who he has never met to partner with them in the gospel, to make the gospel known among the people um, of the, the West. No? Yeah, West. Romans is then a type of letter of, intro- of introduction to a church that the apostle has never met. His rich gospel presentation, therefore, a means towards establishing credibility with the church in Rome and securing their partnership in this mission to Spain. You, you can read that in Romans 15, verse 23 to 24. I think that's on the next slide. So Paul says here, But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a while. So this is not the only reason the Apostle wrote the letter of Romans, but it's one of the main reasons, the historical context of the letter, which helps us to understand why he said certain stuff in the letter. So we see in Romans, after Paul proclaims God's righteousness um, revealed in the gospel, as we see all throughout Romans 1 to uh, 12 to 14, he, he explains how the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. How can we be made righteous before God? How can we as sinners who all sin and fall short of the glory of God, how can we be made right with God? And this is what every world religion somehow tries to answer. How can I be made right with my Creator? But every world religion fails to answer that question logically and truthfully and historically, except the Gospel. Why? Because every one of them provides us with rules and regulations on how to get to God. Whereas the Gospel shows us our inability to get to God, our inability to actually obey the law. Although we are responsible for obeying the law, because of our sinful hearts, we've all failed. And we all deserve to die. We all deserve hell. Romans 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. And then it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So where all other world religions teach us how to climb up on the mountain, get to God, work our way there. The gospel shows us our inability to go there. To our, even our unwillingness to start climbing. And shows us God's willingness and God's work of coming down to earth to take our sin upon Himself and to reconcile us with Him. He did the work. That's the gospel. All other religions teach us how, how we should do the work. The gospel teaches us what the work is that Christ has already done for us. And so, as Paul teaches that, the righteousness of God, and explains what it looks like, In our everyday lives, Paul now goes on to explain how this gospel of God's righteousness in salvation is making its way through to the rest of the world. It's not just meant for us. It's not just for us. It's for the world. Why is it necessary for the world? Because all the world has been separated from God. Through Adam, one man's sin, the whole creation, through Adam, has fallen away from fellowship with God. And now the whole world needs the gospel. Only the gospel. Nothing more, nothing else. The gospel. And so in verse 14 we see Paul saying, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. So Paul feels, feels confident about his brothers and sisters in Christ who he hasn't even met. He feels confident that they are full of goodness and knowledge. This sounds like flattery. (laughs) It sounds like he's just trying to um, get into their good books, right? Trying to tell them some lies just so he can get their money to go to his fair, which a lot of um, false teachers do, right? They are false. They're scammers. It gets you to pay the money so that they can do the great work of God in their mansion and private jets. But Paul is not like that. And we all know Paul, the Apostle Paul is not like that at all. On the contrary, it's reality. It's true. These people are full of goodness and knowledge. Why? Because the gospel has already been explained. They are not what they were. They've been changed. 
Their, their nature has been changed. They're no longer what they were before they were saved. When I just came to Christ, um, we were always taught to give testimonies of your life, right? Like how you came to Christ and how you got saved and whatever. And then you, you, you'd call it your BC date, your before Christ date. And this is what Paul is describing in Romans 3, in, in the Gospel, in, in Romans. It's like he's describing these people before they met Christ and then after they met Christ. Listen to how crazy these scriptures are in Romans 1, verse 28 to 31. It says, Paul says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Foolish, faithful, heartless, and ruthless. Can you be any more blunt? Can you be any more offensive than that? Imagine someone tells you, you are evil covetousness. You are full of covetousness, full of malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, members of evil. And so family, this is our nature before we met Christ. But this is no longer who we are because of the gospel. And this is the beauty of the gospel. This is why the gospel is such good news. Because whoever is in this state really falls under the judgment of God. God has saved us from this. From hating Him to loving Him. Why do you love God? Well, sometimes we get to give an answer like... Because he's beautiful, because he's awesome, because he's loving, because he's righteous, because he's awesome. You know, all these great answers. Are, yes, that's why you love God. There's a, there's a few good causes for loving God. But the main reason you love God is because he loved you first. Right? He doesn't love me because I love him. I love him because he loves me. And how am I able to love God? It's when he saves me from my hate of him. I can't muster up love for God out of myself. I don't want to. But the gospel changes my desire. The gospel changes my will. It changes my will towards God and away from sin towards God. So how is it possible for the Roman believers to be full of goodness and knowledge? How can they now be filled with high moral character, which is just a description of goodness, right? High, high moral character, maturity, wisdom. And it's simple. The answer is the gospel. Roman, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the old, the new has come. So there was like an old creation, now there's a new creation. It's like a cat turning into a dog. It's a whole different thing. It's now, it once was a, a sinner, now it's a saint. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against Him, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Their minds, family, are no longer corrupted. Our minds are no longer corrupted. Even though we still have a remnant of sin in us. We're not perfect, right? It's not what we are saying. We're not perfect. We don't know all the truth. But we've got access to it. And we're being sanctified towards it daily. Our minds have been renewed. Romans 12 verse 2. 12 verse 1. Offer your bodies up as a living sacrifice to God. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewal. It's a process by which our minds are renewed. Our, our thinking is changing. And it's so beautiful to see the connection between being a new creation and being called to ministry. You see this immediately. It says, um, all this is from God. Of course, He changed your nature. He changed you from a sinner into a saint. Who through Christ reconciled us to Himself, He brought us into relationship, 
with himself. And then he gives us the ministry of reconciliation. Immediately. <laughs> not, not 50 years after we become a Christian and now we mature enough to start ministering to others. But this is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans as well. He says that you are able to instruct one another. In verse, yeah, verse, verse 14. Filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. This is beautiful. If you, are, if you are one chapter in the Bible ahead of someone else who just started reading the Bible, you are able to start instructing them. You are able to start teaching them what you've learned from the Scriptures. You've been entrusted with that. So this passage in Romans 15 verse 14, it says also that um, it indicates that virtue and truth are inseparable. You know, we, we can have one or the other, but that's, both of those are ditches that we might fall into. Deception. So, so, for example, you have knowledge, but without truth. Well, that's hypocrisy, right? You've got all knowledge without goodness. You don't actually apply those, that word, that truth that you believe. You don't apply it in your life. It's hypocrisy. But then you also have the other side of it, which is goodness without truth. It's called legalism. Or false religion, where we don't know Christ necessarily, but we just seek to conform ourselves to the law. And we fail, we will fail so badly. And so, as we grow in our knowledge of God, we are enabled to grow in His likeness. And that's why knowledge of God and obedience go together. As I know Him, I'm empowered to become more like Him. I'm I'm changed so that I want to become more like Him. If you know Christ and you get to know Christ, there's this irresistible urge and desire to really just be like Him, to conform to His likeness. Um, There's just something I I took from Bible.org that took out a principle of this verse 14. It says that we can take a ministry principle out of it. it. It says, to minister effectively to others, you must know and personally apply biblical truth in your walk with the Lord. Not just knowledge, but goodness. Not perfection, but growth. And I think this is something I want to encourage you with this morning. I, I feel encouraged by this. Is that not, we are not required to be perfect, but we are required to grow. Growth is the, is the qualification. Growth is the standard. <coughs> Not perfection, to encourage, to exhort, to lead, to disciple. Romans 15, verse 15, it says, But on some points, Paul says, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace given me by God, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So, although the Christians in Rome knew much of what Paul was saying in these chapters, he says it was necessary to remind them, and not just to remind them, but to remind them boldly. Family, this is why we need to constantly be reminded of our fallen nature before we met Christ, so that we might be constantly reminded, reminded of our need for Christ, of our need for a Savior. Otherwise, we start becoming prideful and boastful and arrogant in the presence of God and saying, well, I'm a Christian now already for 40 years. I'm doing a great job. No, you're not. It's the Holy Spirit through you. And we don't get to take any credit for our salvation, for our righteousness, because it's not ours. It's His. And so Paul reminds them very boldly of the grace given Him by God. So we also need to remind it of the essential truths of the gospel. We never graduate from the gospel. Please be reminded of this family, but you don't graduate, you don't go beyond the gospel to greater things, deeper things. The whole scripture is the gospel. This reveals to us Christ. And who who is the gospel? The gospel is not just a message, it's a person. It's Jesus Christ. That God became a man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we should have died. Taking our place. Giving us His righteousness. Life. Eternal life. How can you go beyond that? Charles Spurgeon also said it. Is that, no, it was, yeah, it was Charles Spurgeon who said it. It would take me a whole, a whole eternity to answer the question, why does God love me? 
There's nothing in me that would compel God to love me. There's nothing in me that's not from Him. Nothing good in me that's not from Him. So, what is there in me that He might need? Well, nothing. Because it's His anyway. But whatever is His, I, took, I already messed it up. I already sinned. And so I've given Him every reason not to love me. And yet, despite that, He's chosen to love me. And that's why it will take all of eternity to try and comprehend and grasp why God has chosen to love me. We don't graduate from that. We soak in that. We stay there. We swim in that tube. <laughs> we stay there. Once we go beyond that, or out of that, we start losing the focus for why we are here. The focus for why we gather to church, why we are Christians in the first place. Verse 16, Paul describes himself as a minister of Christ to the Gentiles and a priest in the service of the gospel. So Paul is a priest. Why is he a priest? Because he connects the people with God, right? He represents the people in front of God, and especially the Gentiles. Who's the Gentiles? Well, it's not the Jews. <laughs> Those are not the Jews, right? And the Gentiles were considered separated from God. They were considered dirty and unclean, impure. But listen to Paul's word, and he says, to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles and the priestly service of the gospel of God, to that, so that the offering of the Gentiles, what? Like, Paul is, <laughs> Paul is offering the Gentiles to God. Isn't that an unclean thing? Why would he offer an unclean thing? You can't offer unclean things in the scriptures. It's, it, it's an abomination. It's, it's bad. So, Paul is saying, he offers the Gentiles to God. Why? Because through Christ, through the gospel. Remember, we are Gentiles, right? We're not Jews. We're Gentiles. He's been brought to God. And we are now offered to God as a, as a sacrifice. But how can we be offered if we're not clean? Well, the gospel cleanses us. The gospel makes us worthy sacrifice, Acceptable sacrifices. That actually do honor God. That actually do glorify God. And so he represents the people before God. And in this context, his priestly ministry is to present God an offering of a multitude of Gentile converts. An offering must be holy, pure, sanctified, which Gentiles were not as considered by Jews all throughout the Old Testament. But through the gospel, they've been cleansed. They've been forgiven as though they've never sinned. And not just sinless, but also righteous. Not just cleansed, justified as though they actually not just sin but as though they obeyed because Christ obeyed for us another truth from this passage is the significance of Paul's sacrifice of his ministry to God family God has gifted you as an individual with a calling with a ministry wherever you might find yourself in your life and he's called you to offer that to him as a sacrifice as an offering to worship Him, not for your own glory. He's not given it to you for your own fame, for the sake of your own glory. He's given it to you as a sacrifice to Himself. And in the same way, we are called to worship God through our gifts and callings. He gave it for our enjoyment. Yes, I believe so. I believe we are called to enjoy our callings and our giftings. But it's mostly and primarily for the glory of God. And I find joy in the glory of God. I find joy in glorifying Him. Because that's what we've been created for. And it sets us free from people pleasing. If I'm called to be a pastor, right? Let's say, for example, I'm called to be a pastor like Damon is. Damon is a beautiful, Pastor Damon is a beautiful example of this. He preached the truth without, without necessarily caring what people say about that truth. Because the truth is what God has called him to preach. Period. Even if it's offensive, even if it's not nice to you, you'll say it, you'll always say it in a nice way. <laughs> 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 but it's not necessarily nice to you. And so, if he's called by God to do that, why would he bother trying to please the people who he's not called? 
And so I, mean, I just want to, I need to start finishing off, so I just, I'll run through this. Um, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 to 29. Paul says, But God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Paul is just before this, he, he spoke about in Christ Jesus, then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. So he's boasting in his work for God. But I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. So Paul, Paul is boasting about his accomplishments, but not in his accomplishments, but in Christ because of his accomplishments. But he, he's seen that the, his accomplishments are there because of Christ. He can't save people. Family, that's the thing. Like, if you're on ministry, you can't save anyone. <laughs> you can proclaim the gospel, you, but you can't change someone's heart. Why would you take credit for it? But you would find joy in it. You would find glory in it. For representing Christ. And being able, being able to see the fact that God is using you as a vessel. A broken vessel. But a vessel nonetheless for His glory. And how many other things are there that churches boast in nowadays? Like their buildings, right? They will be like, wow, this is the church and this is... What their building is like. This church is known for its buildings. This church is known for its fame. This church is known for its, its charismatic pastor. This church is known for um, its you know, social, economic group of people, group of Christians, church, filled with these kind of people. I believe that the only thing that we ought to boast in is the work of God through us, through our hands, in this community, in the lives of others. Everything that Paul was was because of God's mercy. He didn't, even, he, he didn't save himself. He can't even take credit for his salvation. Why would he take credit for his ministry? Right? He wouldn't be a minister. He wouldn't be a, he wouldn't be a, um, a doctor. He wouldn't be an uh, engineer if it weren't for God who created you in the first place. <laughs> right? He's the one giving you life. He's the one who gave you those gifts. So he's given it to you. Given it to you for his glory. Mm-hmm. And then finally, just verse 18 and 19. Um, the grace of God, the grace that God has towards the apostle was further manifested in word and deed. Um, verse 18. By word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and all the way to Elycrium, um, I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. So these signs and wonders were merely there to authenticate the gospel message that Paul had preached. And I think we also ought to look back at history and look at that, at those things that happened and find comfort in the fact that this is true. God showed and authenticated His message, the gospel, through signs and wonders, people being raised from the dead, people being healed from their sicknesses and their diseases, and the lame being able to walk, the blind being able to see, the deaf being able to hear. Those things really happened. Is it possible for God to do that again? Yes, absolutely. But why did He do it? For people's enjoyment, for people to be free from disease and all those things. I don't. I don't think so. that's not the main reason He did it. He did it to authenticate the gospel, to show us that there's a life after this one, to prove to us as a token, a physical token, of the spiritual reality of these things. And that, Paul says in Romans 15 verse 20, And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never heard have been told of them will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Paul's goal was to reach the unreached. The primary function of a New Testament evangelist. And there is a role for a pastor teacher as well. And this is not what Paul was saying. He was saying, I'm the evangelist. I go and build the foundation. I don't want to build on someone else's foundation. But there is a place for building on someone else's foundation. That's why he left those places. Otherwise, those churches would just have collapsed. Someone wasn't building. But this is the purpose of the church. This is how the church ought to function. They ought to build on the foundation, raise up leaders, Raise up evangelists, raise up teachers and ministers and 
people who go out into the workplace, go out into the world to preach the gospel and eventually start building a new foundation in a place that's never been, never heard, they've never been reached. And start building a foundation so that, that can start happening again. And that guy goes on and he starts building the foundation again. He starts building again. It's a new foundation. And there's, so there's purpose behind why Paul wanted to not build on someone else's foundation. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim or we make it our ambition to please Him. Um, 2 Corinthians. So, so you see there's a connection between my ambition to preach the gospel where it's not been preached yet and my aim to please God. I believe for you to please God, your, your ambition to please God should align with your calling as a Christian, with what you've been gifted, with what you've been given by God. To make your ambition. Go and do that. To fulfill your part, your role in the body. To be the hand, to be the foot, to be the mouth, to be the eye. And that's why you please God, right? To do what He's called you to. Um, Second, uh, Second Timothy 2 verse 3. Share in suffering as a good shoulder. Uh, shoulder, uh, shoulder. I need to stop now. No. <laughs> I think it's enough. Um, Says, Paul says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No sh- soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Family, this is such a hardcore, straight and narrow, this is what we are here for, for. This is what we are here for. Whether we live or whether we die, our aim is to please God. No looking to the side, no looking back. We're like, this is what we are here for. No soldier gets entangled with civilian pursuits. The soldiers, they march together towards one place. They've got one destination. This is what they're on a mission right now. They don't go to the sides and start chowing on the apples. They don't go to the sides and go to the mall first, right? And they'll go, go do a little bit of shopping or whatever. They've got a mission. They, they don't get distracted. They don't get distracted by the, the things of this world, the Netflixes, the YouTube, the Instagrams, the TikToks, the, the, the smoking, the drinking and all those things, they, they're here for one specific purpose and they won't be distracted. They've got a single narrow-mindedness towards what God has called them to do. What are we here for? We are here to make the glory of God known through the gospel to all people. It's never hope. And you are part of that. John Piper has said that um, you are either a sender, a goer, or disobedient. Right? So we, we're either part of, the, we're part of the fulfilling the Great Commission, but your role in that looks different for everyone. You either pray, you give, or you go. You either send, or you go, or you disobedient. Because Christ's commission is so clear. And so what is the end goal of the labor of teaching and preaching and building on someone's foundation? It's to spread the gospel, to multiply, multiply, and multiply, to continue doing that. And I just want to finish off with one last thought. Why would we go to those places that's within unreached if there's so much work to do here in Worcester? Right, that's a common objection against going overseas, going to Nepal, because this is very much of an introduction to next weekend's sermon. The next weekend's visit from, from the, the missionaries. Why would we go if there's so much work to be done here? Because Christ commands it. Matthew 28, it's about the nation. We love Jesus, right? So that's why we can obey His commands. But secondly, because they are lost without the gospel. If we don't go, I, I can't make an ultimate statement on this because this is a very it's a controversial thing. It's a gray area. Um, so don't, don't reject me for it. Um, but I believe we ought to take a theological position on this issue of those who have never heard of Christ. That they are in sin and because of that, Separated from God, and when they die, go to hell. Is that unfair? Well, it seems unfair, yes, but not from God's side, from human side, because we're not going. We've not preached the gospel to them. Right? So it's not unfair. Why? why? God has actually provided a way for them to be saved. Is it unfair for God to send anyone to hell? No. I almost want to say hell no. Like, it's not, it's, 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 it's not unfair for God to send anyone to hell. On the contrary, it almost seems more unfair to send anyone to heaven after all the sin. 
<laughs> what is unfair is us living our lives oblivious to, rea- to the reality of 4,300 people groups. Is it, is it the amount? 4,700 people groups. 47% of the world's population has not even heard that Christ came to die for sinners so that they might be set free from this and forgiven and have eternal life. Thirdly, because there's a, there's, we also go because there's a difference between lost people and unreached people. Do you know that? There's a difference between those who've heard the gospel 50,000 times in their life and still choose to rebel against God and those who've not heard it once. They haven't had one chance to repent. And that's a whole different calling. That's a whole different ministry. That's a tough one. The one working amongst the lost. This is what we do in Worcester. There's no one who's never heard of Jesus before. Yeah, I died. Because you see it everywhere. Hundreds of churches in town. What we are working, what we are dealing with in Vusta is lost people. It's kind of, who's just rejected the gospel. We are thankful towards God. That's also why we go. Hearts are thankful for God saving us. We love people. And finally, because it, it could have been me who never heard. Who was born. Family, we need to love ourselves into this life. We need to love people, right, as we love ourselves. So I was born, I was raised, and I died, and not once did I get the opportunity to repent, to receive the gift of eternal life. And I believe through the sovereignty of God, God is not God's hands are not cut off, and He's not like, oh, I wanted I wanted you guys to go so badly, but you just didn't want to go, and now I can't do anything. God is still sovereign. He works and his mission will be fulfilled but and but that's the thing sometimes people use god's sovereignty as a way of saying wow that's why i'm not going to go because if god wants those people to be saved he'll save them anyway right but that's not how he works on the contrary he works through us because he's sovereign it doesn't give me doubt for going it gives me confidence for going because i know the work will be effective. It was, if it wasn't my hands, I wouldn't go. I would be afraid. I would be scared. So let's just finish off with the last verse and then, then I'm done. Verse 21. Look, listen to this beautiful promise. We can be part of the fulfillment of this promise. It, the promise the promise's fulfillment does not rest on us, but we can be part of, the, of its fulfillment because we will have it. I want to be part of it. Romans 15 verse 21. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. Salvation belongs to God. Listen to this beautiful. Can, can, you, can you hear it? Like it will happen. Those who have never been told of him, they will see and they will understand. And that's why salvation does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. If it depended on human beings, they would only hear but never understand. They would never see. God is sovereign and that's why we go. That's why we pray. That's why we give. God will make sure His purposes are fulfilled. Um, 2 Timothy 2.10 just says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Family, I'm going to encourage you this morning to Spend your life for the glory of God and the gospel to be known amongst all people. Those friends and family who are lost, proclaim the gospel with boldness and courage and confidence, knowing that this is the only way to salvation. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you have not yet repented of your sin, to come to Christ, to be set free, to have eternal life, to be given to you as a gift, best news ever. It's why we live. It's why we exist. It's to know it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your gift of life in Christ. And we thank you that you have called us to be part of your mission to fulfill the great commission. 
We make it our ambition to do what you've called us to do, what you've commanded us to do. Help us do that. And next weekend, as we listen to Paul and Tony and their stories, help us to live ourselves into their lives, Lord, and to be part of, of what you are doing across the world. Thank you for your mercy, your grace towards us human beings who have fallen short, who have sinned against you. And we pray that we might know you better. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching this video. We pray that you were blessed by this online service. Please take time to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel.